Sean, we've got a fun show today. We've got Ryan Huska, the head coach of the Calgary Flames. We talked to him. Heritage Classic coming up. Brian Slagle, the founder, chairman, CEO of Metal Blade Records. Your buddy, my buddy. He talked to Jack Eichel about music. That's coming up too. But before we get to any of that, Sean, I have a question for you. I have two questions for you. Who's better, the Ottawa Senators or the Detroit Red Wings? And are those the two best teams in the Atlantic Division? Hi, Dan. It's nice to see you, too. We are going to have a great show. It's Thursday, by the way, so it's almost the weekend, and it's going to be a great weekend. But to answer your question, no, they're not the best teams in the Atlantic Division. Uh, You did the power rankings this weekend, and you dealt in early season overreaction. That's what you're dealing in right now is early season overreaction. Neither one of them are the best team in the Atlantic division. Um, Which one is better? I think we'll find out really soon, won't we? At least for a couple of days when they play each other. You know, looking again at early season performances, I'd have to say the Detroit Red Wings. Um, But I don't know that they have the depth to continue to do what they're doing right now. But certainly they're a far better team than they were at the end of last year. Yeah, and I kind of asked those questions in jest because I don't think they are the two best teams in the division, but they are two now of the better teams in the division in a very good division. And we expected Detroit to be better. We expected Ottawa to be better, both pushing for a playoff spot. And I think that's what we'll get in the end of 82 games or you know wherever we are in the season at whatever point. I think you're going to get that, these two teams pushing for a playoff spot. But it's been a terrific start for both of them, and I think they deserve a lot of credit for it. We should be talking about them. You Look, look at the Red Wings. I watched them last night, Wednesday night, against the Pittsburgh Penguins. They were in control. Speed, a lot of speed in their game. And Alex Debrinkit is off to a terrific start. Eight points, five goals, three assists for Alex Debrinkit right now. He he gets he gets three points against the Penguins. He's got a point in every game. It's like that missing ingredient, right? I mean, you're you're talking about a Red Wings team that's been on the rise. Their points percentage has continued to go up. I dealt with this in the mailbag this week, but they needed a guy. Right, they needed that guy, and maybe now that guy is Alex Debrinkit. He looks really good in that uniform. He looks very comfortable there. He looks comfortable with Dylan Larkin, and maybe that one player just slots everybody else where they belong too. Is that as simple? Can it be as simple as that for the Red Wings? Just in terms of how they how their depth lies and where players play and, and what roles they're supposed to have, because now they've got a guy who could be a 40 goal scorer. Yeah, no, they do. And I, and I think it's a perfect compliment for Dylan Larkin. Like, I think he, it, it's one of those things where they just work really well together. Their, their strengths complement each other. Um, you know, Dylan is, is such a fast player and plays at such speed and, and, you know, to bring it as said, I, it's a different game when I play for, with him. It, it, it's a game that I enjoy and that showed. But then again, I mean, you look at that game against Pittsburgh and you're like, oh, they're fast, they're flying. They they came out and they put a stranglehold on that game. And then they almost spit it up. Yeah. That, that's that, that's, how that's the that's the problem for me with Detroit. When you ask about how good they are, I think they're one of those teams that's still learning how to win games, right? We've talked about this with other teams and and I think they're one of those teams. And and I also, again, I think their depth is at a point where you get later in games and you can start to wear that team down a little bit. They rely on a lot of guys to to play some big minutes, but those guys are starting to come of age. I mean, you, you watch Maurice Sider in that game and he he was fantastic, right? Look, I really like him. I, I, I just, I don't know that they're there yet. That remains to be seen. They're off to a good start. And look, if you get off to a good start, we all know it allows you the cushion to hit the little slump, right? I mean, look at Buffalo, not off to a good start. Very small sample size, but just three games, but they've lost two of them. They haven't looked that good. They've only got six goals in those three games. And that's the team that, you know, I thought was maybe ahead of Ottawa and ahead of Detroit. And they might end up being ahead of Ottawa and, and ahead of Detroit in that division. But they're not building themselves. They're not banking those points now early in the first week, two, three of the season to really give themselves a cushion for for a slide. They're having it now. Now let's flip it to Ottawa, right? Tarasenko comes in. He signs. He's got six points. Stutzla looks good. Brady Kachuk's got four goals, and they're doing it without a guy who scored 20 goals for them last year. And Shane Pinto, the longer they play well, 
the more leverage they get and the less they actually need a Shane Pinto. And Josh Norris comes back and plays, and he makes an impact. You hope he can stay healthy. But th this is an Ottawa team right now that looks like it's also flying. But I have the same questions that you brought up with Detroit. I have the same ones with Ottawa. Are they going to be able to keep it out of the net? Are they going to be able to play the type of game that they can lock it down when they have a lead? Is the goaltending going to be good enough? The fact is both of these teams are three and one right now, and they're looking pretty good. Ottawa's still weak down the middle, right? Like you could say they don't need Shane Pinto because they're three and one. They need another center. Yeah. Like I, I think that's obvious. You look at this team and that's obvious when they play elite teams who have hit their stride, they're going to have trouble matching up. Um, it's as simple as that. So, uh, look, it's great that both of them are off to a good start. It's going to be a great game when they play each other. Alex DeBrinkett is not going to be very welcome um, going back into the nation's capital. But that makes it fun. I mean, we, we saw that the other day, right, with a P.L. Dubois, as he likes to be known now. He goes into Winnipeg, public enemy number one, booing him all over the place. He said they were dubs, not boos. And scores a goal, scores the first goal, and his new team, the Kings, just ran the, the Jets right out of the building. But it made for great theater, and that's what's going to happen to a degree, I think, when Debrinkit goes back to Ottawa. I don't I don't know that the angst is quite as high as it was in Winnipeg. They took it as a personal affront that he wanted to leave. Um, so we'll see. The other team in that division I wanted to talk about, the Atlantic division, is Tampa Bay. Tampa, it, like... We're, we're to, we deal with overreactions. We did a little bit of this last week, right? We each had an overreaction last week. And the Super 16, which you can find on NHL.com right now, it's ran Thursday. Today is Thursday. It deals in overreactions. But the Tampa Bay Lightning, it has to be an overreaction because we've only got four games. And there's institutional knowledge of what this Lightning team can be and should be and typically always is with the core that they have. But they're, they're not off to a good start. They're one, two, and one in four games. They've given up a lot of goals. We know they don't have Andre Vasilevsky in net. They won on opening night, haven't won since. Is it right to think that the Tampa Bay Lightning are in trouble? Not for me, it's not. There's just too much talent on that team. Look, we talk all the time about teams being able to outscore their problems, right? The Edmonton Oilers, all they'll outscore their problems. The New Jersey Devils, all they'll outscore their problems. Right? Who? I mean, we put other teams in that. Well, the Toronto Maple Leafs, they'll outscore their problems. But all of a sudden, the three-time Stanley Cup finalist, two-time Stanley Cup champion can't outscore their problems with some of the greatest offensive talent in the National Hockey League glittered through their roster, both at forward and defense. They lost the number one goalie in the league, probably, and now they can't outscore their problems. They're, they're, they're not like these other teams, and I don't understand why. Well, I mean, look, Detroit and Ottawa and Buffalo right now, to a degree, even though they're not off to a great start, they're the teams on the rise. They're the teams that people want to talk about, right? That that's So they get a different narrative around them, whereas the Tampa Bay Lightning, people are wondering, okay, how long can it last, right? I mean, they, they've, they've lost players every single year. They've had to move players out that were a part of a championship core or championship team, and and. They've lost their depth. They don't have the depth that they had when they went to the Stanley Cup final three straight years. It's not. They can't. The cap just is what it is. A flat cap has has taken that away from them and they've had that inability. So that's why it gets talked about. It's the teams in that division, like I mentioned, Detroit, Ottawa, and Buffalo, they're on the rise. So people are looking for the positives. It's Tampa Bay Lightning. How long can they last? So it's easy to find the negatives. That's just the way it goes. And now they're without Andre Vasilevsky, not off to a great start. Frankly, Sean, I think they are in a, in a little bit of trouble. And I think it is fair to worry about the Tampa Bay Lightning at this point in the season because you've got other teams in that division that are jumping out to quick starts. And heck, even the Boston Bruins, they've only played two games to date, but they won them both. They look pretty good in doing so. and they're, So they're not going anywhere, right? We wonder about Buffalo. Can they pick it up? Well, they're another team on the rise. So that's what we're looking at, right? Ottawa, Detroit, like I said, Florida, I'm not so sure, right? I mean, Toronto's right there. So I think it's fair to wonder about the Lightning. I think it's fair to question, are they in a little bit of a trouble right now? Because they they have not shown that ability to outscore their problems in a very, very small sample size. Are the Edmund Oilers a legitimate Stanley Cup? I don't hopeful? know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if they are. To be honest with you, I look at that. Look, at, look out West, okay? And we're going to talk about the Edmonton Oilers, by the way. Good little segue here. We're going to do a little 
Battle of Alberta because we got Ryan Huska from the Calgary Flames, their head coach, first year head coach. We got the Heritage Classic coming up at Commonwealth Stadium October 29th. 20 years, Sean, you were there 20 years ago. You can touch on that a little bit. But you ask about the Oilers. They, they are a team we know, and they did this against Nashville the other night. They win six to one. And Dry Sidle, McDavid, Nugent Hot. I mean, they just they just find ways to score, right? They got outshot in that game 44 to 30, I think it was. Uh, so it really didn't, it wasn't necessarily played like a 6-1 game, but the Oilers can do that to teams. That's what they can do. They can make it a 6-1 game like that. In the blink of an eye, they can do things like that. But can you continuously go into games with the second best goaltender in the game, with the second best defense core in the game, and consider yourself a legitimate Stanley Cup contender? And I wonder, like, is that going to continue for the Oilers this season? Or is is it going to be Jack Campbell who jumps out and says, no, 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 I'm the guy. I can do it. It's my team. I'm running with it. Or is it going to be Stuart Skinner? It, right now, I look at them and I say, I think they are. I think they can be. But on most nights, they have the second best goalie. On most nights, they have the second best decor. You missed my point completely. My point being that the Edmonton Oilers, as they're presently constructed and as they've presently played to this point, nobody's worried about them. They're going to go into the playoffs, not a problem. Boom. Tampa Bay Lightning have played the exact same way, the exact same way, but they're in the sewer. Like, why would you even be concerned? If Vasilevsky wasn't hurt, would there be any concern with this team? He's not done for the year. He comes back. They go on a heater. There's no problems in South Florida. Yeah, if he comes back and there's, they're, they're going to be involved, there's no question about it. But they're, they're, again, I, they don't have the same depth. They don't have the same depth. So, listen, it's overreaction time. That's what we're doing here. If I didn't overreact right now, you wouldn't overreact to my overreaction. And that's what makes it fun, okay? That's what makes this enjoyable, this conversation. Like I said, Ryan Husk is coming up. Going to have that interview with Calgary Flames coach. Brian Slagle. Founder, chairman, CEO of Metal Blade Records, talked music with Jack Eichel from the Vegas Golden Knights. We listened in on that conversation as Brian was having it with Jack. It was fascinating, and Eichel knows his music. Brian knows his music. Sean, you know your music. Jack Eichel knows his music. So you're going to listen here that soon. But quickly, before we get to Ryan Huska, Sean, the Battle of Alberta, it's great. We we talk about it a little bit with him. 20 years ago, you were there. Maybe the coldest day of your life, I would imagine. What was that like at the Heritage Classic at Commonwealth Stadium? Because I don't think, at least I hope, it's not going to be as cold on October 29th when the Flames and Oilers play there again. Well, it was Canadians and Oilers at that time. If you don't think I haven't looked at the forecast, Dan, because <laughs> I have PTSD, you'd be wrong because I have. It will not be as cold, and I'm thankful for that, although it's a memory and the cold is a part of the memory. It's a memory that'll never, ever go away. Look, it's the foundation. It's the cornerstone. It's the jumping off point of everything the NHL has ever done outside. That was not an NHL initiative. That was a Edmonton Oilers initiative where they wanted to do something special. And they made it happen. And Dan Craig, who went on to become the ice technician for us, built that rink and, and struggled through countless obstacles with no knowledge no institutional knowledge of how to build a rink outside like it was done on the fly you covered the first winter classic in, in buffalo and as much as that was done on the fly at least they had the information from the heritage classic they had nothing and they built this rink in commonwealth stadium that was unbelievable they had an alumni game that was ridiculous with the star power gila floor all these guys played Mark Messier, uh, you know, not even phased by the coal, all, all the Canadians legends, Mark Messier, who was playing in the league at the time, just said, Hey, I want to see you guys later. He's playing for the Rangers. Yeah. He's like, I want to see you guys later. I, I, there's no way I'm missing this. I got to go play he, in this. <laughs> he was an active player in the NHL. And he was just like, this is so cool. I'm taking off. Yeah. 
Like that's how cool it was. And and then they played the game and, you know, you'll never forget the toque, right. Uh, on, on the goalie and, and all the things that happened. I spent the first period of the actual game between the two teams in the stands. My pen stopped writing within three minutes. The guy next to me was drinking a beer. It was a slushy by the five minute mark. Um, and, and nobody complained. Everybody sat there. Some people sat outside for eight hours. They watched the alumni game and then they watched the real game. And I have a new appreciation for what the people in the plains of Canada do because that is rugged. Yeah. I was not there. You were. It's pretty good stuff there, Sean. I mean, it's a great story. We touched on that with Ryan Huska a little bit as well. His memories from just watching that game between the Canadians and Oilers and what it's going to be like on October 29th when he's behind the bench with the Calgary Flames against the Edmonton Oilers at Commonwealth Stadium for the Tim Hortons Heritage Classic. Here's the interview with Ryan Huska. Ryan, thanks for joining us. So, start of the season, first time running the NHL bench for you. I mean, what, what's this been like for you a couple of games in now? It's been good. I mean, we're we feel like we're steadily getting better every game, and that's the the one important thing for us. You know, we're we're sitting at 500 right now after three games, but we've seen some some positive trends of the the group going in the right direction, which is what we like to see. What did you identify as your biggest challenge coming into this year? Obviously, you were very familiar with the team, but when you looked at it, what was the one thing you keyed on and said, "This is what we have to be better at." Uh, I, I think there's two things really. I mean, we gave up a lot of quality chances last year. Um, didn't give up a lot of zone time. I thought we were excellent in that area, but in regards to the types of chances that we gave up, um, we made the uh, the nights too difficult on a goal on our goaltenders far too often. So that would be one thing that we put a focus on um, reducing the if you want to call them grade A chances against. And I think the other thing is is trying to kind of flip the mentality about playing the game a little bit faster. And a lot of that is just thinking it and letting the puck do the work sometimes, but um, putting yourself in the mindset where we want to try to attack our opponents a little quicker than what we did in the past. How have you seen, you you know, you talk about, you know, getting better, it's working, getting, you know, improving. So what is, what areas, I mean, you've played only a handful of games here, three games as we talk. So what, what are we looking at here as areas that you are identifying and saying, you know what, from the preseason through practices in camp, game one, game two, game three, here, here's what we're improving at right now. I'd say there's two things. The The first one is skating. As simple as that sounds, we're starting to move our feet with and, and without the puck instead of standing and, and watching. So that's a, a real big thing for us. And I think our team, when I, I talk about playing it a little bit quicker, um, you need to work for the puck carrier a lot of times. And I feel like we're we're starting to get you know, much better in that area. And that's something that we have to continue to see as we move forward, for sure. You lose the game against Washington, but it seemed like you were in control of that game. And, you know, you outshot them. You, you, you had a had a, had a good, uh, good game, good start. But that was another thing, right? I mean, you're up two to nothing. You can't, you, you, you lose the lead. You're, you're up, you score the first goal, I think it was against Pittsburgh, and, and, it, and it doesn't translate. Is that something now that you guys have to work through here? Absolutely. That's that's part of growing too, right? I mean, um, last night I look at it as a little different situation than it was in Pittsburgh. I felt in Pittsburgh, um, we were in control of the game five on five for the, for the most part for the first two periods. And then um, they cranked it up in the third period and um, the game got away from us fairly quickly there. It was a different situation last night in Washington where I felt we were pretty consistent all the way through. Um, even when we we gave up the two goals and got ourselves back to a tie game, I thought we continued to push and we had lots of chances to win that game. And um, just our, our mindset that if you stay that way and you, and you work the right way for each other, those will eventually turn in your favor. Hey, you're, you're not going to win them all. Um, but when you're when your process is right, and you're doing things the right way. Eventually, um, you're going to see yourself on the right side of the scoreboard more often than not. This is an opportunity. It's obviously a big one. It's your first opportunity to be an NHL head coach. So how have you taken it? I mean, are you like, what, how do you handle it internally? Do you put a lot of pressure on yourself? Are you a guy that, you know, do you look at it and say, I've got assistance for a reason and I'm going to utilize them. You were an assistant for five seasons with the flames. I mean, what's your approach now as an NHL head coach? Yeah. All of the above, I guess, when you think about it, I'm, I'm, proud as anybody to be in this situation that I'm in here. And um, I feel very fortunate to be one of the, the head coaches in the National Hockey League right now. But uh, I think there's so much that comes along with um, 
being a head coach besides the actual X's and O's of the game that you have to trust and lean on your assistants um, heavily. Uh, and all those guys have a massive role for us to play, um, whether it's the special teams, whether it's face-offs, whether it's breaking our opponents down. Um, you, you can't do that all on your own. So um, for me, it's it's making sure that we're as a staff as prepared as we possibly can be and then trusting the guys to do their jobs along the way. And I think when when we get that rhythm moving along nicely, I, I think we're going to be in real good shape because we've liked what our staff's looked like so far. You have a unique opportunity coming up at the end of the month in the Heritage Classic. And I'm curious, A, a what your outdoor memories are as a kid and B, do you remember the first Heritage Classic 20 years ago and kind of your thoughts in watching that? It launched this whole wave of outdoor games that have become so commonplace in the NHL now. Yeah, two for that question, I would say I grew up in BC. So unfortunately, where I grew up, there wasn't a lot of uh, outdoor rinks because it never really got all that cold when I was a younger guy. I mean, every once in a while, my dad would try. Um, the outdoor rink would last for a little bit and then it would get soft and slushy. But um, really, my first taste of the ODRs was in Calgary when we got there. Um, and my son and I were on it all the time. And I think it's such a um, such a cool thing to be able to do as a, as a young man and even as a dad watching your kid out there playing because that's really what they do is just go out there and play and have a blast. In regards to the first one, um, I don't remember a ton about it. I remember the jerseys and I also remember it being really cold. Um, <laughs> and I've talked to a lot of guys that were a part of that and they said it was it was almost miserable how cold it was that day. Um, so I think when we have our opportunity to be a part of this, um, based on the where it lies on the calendar, I'd be shocked if it gets anywhere near that cold. I think the temperatures are going to be perfect for a great event, and we're really looking forward to it for sure. Has there been any talks amongst the staff yet about the look? Have you guys had that first meeting yet on how you're going to make your statement? No, not really. I think the varsity jackets are always a part of it. I think that's something that's a pretty cool um, look. And then uh, we leave a lot of that up to our equipment guys. Mark DePasquale is fantastic with that. So we'll see what he has in order. But if I can go back a little bit, um, we played an outdoor game a, a few years ago in Regina. And the conditions for that game were awesome. Like it, there was a little bit of light snow falling. It really gave it the um, the feel of of playing outside and almost as you were as a, as a younger guy or when I watch my son play on the ODRs and have to kind of shovel it off from time to time. It's such a neat thing. So our, our players are really fortunate to be a part of this. Our staff's fortunate to be a part of this. Um, and it makes it better that it's a battle of Alberta. Isn't it? I mean, as a dad, don't you just want to, I know you're the coach, but maybe grab a shovel, right? You know, in between periods and then start shoveling it off to get the guys back on the ice. Uh, it's pretty neat. It really is. I mean, the day before in Regina, it was warm. We guys had t-shirts on and no jackets. Then the next day, the weather flipped a little bit where it was a little bit cooler. Nothing like it was um, in Edmonton 20 years ago, but um, it was cooler and we did get a little snow that night. This is one of those things that the NHL has, has really grabbed a hold of and, and, no matter where it is and who's in it, it seems like it's always a good time, a great memory. And when you know now that you're going to get that opportunity in a little less than two weeks, I mean, is that what you're thinking too? Like, okay, we want the, the wins important. The two points are important, but boys, guys, coaches, players, let's make sure we appreciate what we got here. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the, the neatest things about those outdoor games is the NHL's made them events where you've got Nickelback playing at this one. Um, you've got all sorts of things that are going to be going on around the game uh, to make this uh, really a, a neat experience for, for not just the fans, but the teams that are there, the players, the staff, as you mentioned. And we will want our players to embrace it. I mean, who knows if they're ever going to get a chance to play in one of those games again. And really, um, to have this experience, to be able to go through it with a group of your buddies, I, I think is just a, a really cool thing for us to be a part of, for sure. Your team hasn't changed a ton, but this is the earliest outdoor game in, in the history of all the ones that we've done. With it being so early, do you almost look at it as a bonding experience because of all the unique opportunities that happen between, like we talked about, the players are probably going to come up with some sort of sort of theme night um, for their dress, um, some of the opportunities they have around the game. Do you see this as something that can kind of bring a team together this early in the year? Yeah, I do. And that's a good question. I don't think it's just the the players and our staff, as we talked to before, um, like we're going to we're going to make it about our families, too, which is something that I think the the players 
um, will appreciate because as much as we try to keep everybody connected and Calgary is a great city to be able to do that, um, this is an opportunity for some of the wives and some of the young kids to come out and watch their dad on the outdoor rink, have a chance to skate on it with them. Um, so we're trying to make it not just about us, but it's about our families and all the the work and the sacrifices that they put into it as well over the years to allow their husbands to play the game, to allow us to coach the game. So it's it's something that we're not taking for granted, that's for sure. If I could, I just want to change the subject a little bit because you talk about, um, you know, embracing, right? You're a guy who played one NHL game in, in your entire playing career. You got one game. I looked it up. So here it is, January 5th, 1998, Blackhawks. You played for the Hawks against the Flames. 1-1 one, one tie. You got eight shifts, five minutes and 51 seconds of ice time. What do you remember about that? Uh, well, there's a lot, actually. There's I'll tell a couple quick stories. Jerome McGinley was my roommate um, in junior in Kamloops. Um, and I had a chance to play against Jerome McGinley in that game. So that one was a pretty cool thing because Jerome was at that point um, starting to take off as one of the best players in the game. So it was neat to be able to play against him. Um, I think that whole situation for me, I was a member of the Blackhawks organization for five years since I was drafted with them. And I never really, if we're being honest, I wasn't good enough to play in the NHL. Neither um, was I. Yeah, but <laughs> Bob Murray, who was the GM at the time, I think um, because I had been in the minor league system, I was their captain in Indianapolis. Um, he gave me an opportunity to play the one game. So for that, I'm forever grateful. The second quick story about it is I got called up that time because Brent Sutter had a groin injury. So he wasn't able to play the night. And coming after that game, coming back to the rink in the morning, um, watching him walk around, he could hardly get around. So in my head, I'm thinking, this is perfect. I'm getting at least one more game up here. This is going to be awesome. He ends up going out for a pregame skate and he comes back in and says, I'm good to go. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? He can hardly walk around, but that's the way the Sutters were at the time. Um, and I quickly got my ticket back to Indianapolis, but it's something that I'll never forget for sure. And I'm grateful to Bob Murray and the Blackhawks for giving me the one game. So you got the one game and, and listen, what means more to you then? Playing the one game in the NHL or coaching your first game and your first win? In the NHL. I mean, I know you were an assistant for five seasons, so you were behind the bench a lot. You saw a lot of NHL hockey. You were a big part of it, but it's got to be different when you coach, when you're the, when you're the head coach. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think they're the first playing a game in the NHL was cool for me, but I think coaching is um, kind of takes the cake. I think because I, I knew I wrote after I got going, I wasn't good enough to play in the NHL, but I felt like I, I could get there another way. And that was through coaching. And, um, you know, you go, through a lot of different paths it takes you a long time to learn how to coach you gotta um, be fortunate to be around some great organizations with some great coaches that you can learn from and I just feel that sticking with it um, when you do get a chance to be a head coach um, it's it's something that I as I mentioned the very first thing I was very proud of and um, it was a special night for me for sure team didn't play all that well but we got a win and that was what mattered in our first game and now it's about trying to continue to get better and better every time we play. Ryan, you mentioned in talking about how special this game is going to be and part of it being that it's the Battle of Alberta. What's the Battle of Alberta mean to you? You've been through it now for multiple iterations and it's it's changed. It's not what it was when you were younger, when I was younger. It, it, it's different now. But what does that what does that rivalry mean to you? Yeah, a, a lot. And you, you mentioned when I was younger. I mean, that's when the NHL was a different game, too. So, you know pretty much if someone got up a goal or two goals, it was going to be, there was going to be fights, there was going to be hits and all that stuff. when those two teams played against each other. Uh, you fast forward to the way it is now, that hatred, if I can say it is still there. And the games, when you are a part of, they're a different level than what the guys um, normally experience in a regular uh, NHL, regular season game. Uh, they just are um, because everybody knows kind of what's at stake. I think the alumni, um, are still edgy whenever we play against them, the fans, um, because it's the way Alberta's set up. It's basically from Red Deer down that are Flames fans, Red Deer up or Oilers fans. So we get a great mix in both arenas. So there's a great atmosphere, great energy about it. Um, and to be a part of it, players find out in a hurry that it's a, a different level than what they've normally been a part of. Do you feel the pressure of it now being a head coach in it? Um, I, I don't know if it's the pressure of it I you know you want to go and you want to win every game I think that's the one thing you prepare um, your team to be the best they can be on every night but 
Um, I, I, I would have to say honestly that you do feel a little bit of more juice and jam when you do play them for sure. Cause it's, uh, it means something to everybody. I expect you to be fully honest when you answer this. What's it like to coach against Connor McDavid and, and, and dry It's a challenge. You know, they're the two of the best players in the game for a reason. The, their skill set is exceptional and the way they play the game with the speed, um, uh, it makes it a real challenge to d- devise a game plan to play against them for sure. Um, and when you're on the bench at times, and, and I still watch them skate around and warm up a lot, um, the, the talent level that these guys have is, is is off the charts, but they're surrounded by really good players too. So um, playing against them is, a, is a, a difficult challenge for any team. And it's, it's one we're going to um, we're going to make sure we're prepared for, and I think we're going to get our guys ready to play against them. And I know there'll be a lot of excitement to to get up there and, and work to get the win. Well, Ryan, thanks so much for, for jumping on with us. This should be fun. Enjoy it. I know you had a couple of games here before the Heritage Classic, but definitely, like you said, embrace it and enjoy it. Thank you very much, guys. Nice talking with you. Good stuff there with Ryan Husky, the first-year coach now of the Calgary Flames, was an assistant there in Calgary for five years. Behind the bench, calling the shots now. Heritage Classic, October 29th, Flames and Oilers at Commonwealth Stadium. So that's a cool thing that's going on, Sean. But another cool thing that's happening is Tuesday, October 24th, Frozen Frenzy. ESPN is all over this. So it's a 16-game night in the NHL. All 32 teams are in action, and every game is going to have a staggered start time starting at 6 p.m. Eastern, all the way till 11. And ESPN, with John Butchergrass and Kevin Weeks, doing the they're doing a whip around. And it's going to start at 7 on ESPN+. Plus. Then it's going to go at 8 o'clock on ESPN2. At the same time, there's a triple header on the main network, ESPN. So you can get three different things going on to, to, to watch games on ESPN, to watch games on ESPN+. Plus and the start of the whip around. And then do, also on ESPN two, you can have another set going to do all the whip around. If you're a hockey fan, I mean, this is, this is everything on a, on a night you, you have to be interested in if you're a hockey fan, because no matter what your team is playing, I think it's going to be a special night to see how it's all going to play out and get highlights and goals and everywhere uh, on so many different places. And the whip around aspect of it is going to be really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's great. Like, you spend all your time streaming, right, and trying to switch from game to game and commercials. Now they're going to do all the work for you. It's a historic night. It's never happened. There's never been 16 NHL games in one night. Um, So if you're not excited about it, I I don't know how big a fan you are because the opportunities are going to be unbelievable. And, you know, it's a little like – I know they they want to walk away from this comparison a little bit because they're not the same and football is much more static game with a lot of stoppages, but that's what it's like, right? When you get in the red zone, they can't do that with hockey because the whole ice is the red zone. My God, Connor McDavid gets the puck behind his own net. That's the red zone in hockey. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's just power plays, start a power plays. So oh, let's go here. Let's go there. You know, momentum switching. Let's go here over time. I, I think it's what you want as a fan and especially as a young fan, right? Like my son's 18 years old. He, he's definitely got sports ADD, right? And this, this feeds right into it. There's no need to do the work. They're going to do the work for you. And one of the things I, you know, in talking with Butchergrass, which I did on, on Wednesday is, you know, and he's right about this fans in hockey can be parochial and you, you like to hear from your guys, right? Like your broadcasters, you want to watch your broadcast. Cause that's what you're familiar with. That's comfortable with, but everybody wants to hear what the national people have to say about their team. And either they're going to agree with it and love that person who's saying it, or they're going to absolutely disagree and hate the person who's saying it. Well, here's your opportunity, right? I mean, that night you can watch your game and still hear what the national perspective is and how, How's a guy like Kevin Weeks seeing it, right? What are they looking at? Because there's going to be, in addition to just bouncing between game to game and the action and the power plays and and things along those lines, penalty shot, you get a penalty shot, they're going to go to it, right? I mean, in addition to all that, there's going to be entertainment, obviously, but there's going to be analysis, and there's going to be a lot of analysis that goes into it because, look, John Butchgrass has been involved in hockey for a long time. Kevin Weeks has been involved in hockey for a long time. They're going to be running this whip around and they have a lot of institutional knowledge of what's gone on in the league. They know people around the league. So there's going to be in information and analysis along with watching things live 
and you're going to get to hear from the national perspective on it if you're just a fan. Like, let's say you're a fan in Columbus and you're used to, you know, Jeff Rimmer and Jody Shelley and they're calling your game. You're going to still get a chance to watch that on ESPN Plus or on your, you know, network that you're on. But you're also going to be able to get the national perspective at the same time. I think that's a pretty cool aspect of it. Yeah, and it plays perfectly into the social part of it, right? Like when you're you're on your device, your second screen, so to speak. I'm I'm not a very young man, so I I don't know all the lingo. But your second screen and your your xing or Instagramming or whatever, and, and then look, obviously, you know, it, it leads into all kinds of other things, fantasy, uh, betting, whatever you want. Like it, it it's it's hockey on steroids, right? Because it's always going to be action. There's never going to be a moment when you're sitting there and going. Oh my God! They're passing the puck back and forth between the two blue lines. Nobody can get into the into the attacking end because that's not what's going to be shown on this. It's going to be go go go. It's going to be interesting to me how it works and what the viewership is too, because it doesn't have to be limited to a sixteen game night. This is a special night. It's a unique night. It doesn't have to be limited to staggered start times. If this works. I think they could do it on an eight game night where four games start at 7 p.m. Eastern. You can jump in live to these games. You can have the analysis, that second screen, if you will, right? I think it could be really, it could be the start of something special, I think. But we got to see how it plays out on, on Tuesday night, October 24th, when they do it. The last game that night is the Vegas Golden Knights against the Philadelphia Flyers. They're the last game that night. And we mentioned it before, Brian Slagle, the founder, CEO, and chairman of Metal Blade Records, had a bit had a great conversation with Jack Eichel. We're going to play that here in a minute. Uh, all music all the time with Eichel and Brian. Uh, but the Vegas Golden Knights, Sean, they're the last game that night on the 24th. They're right now, they're 4-0 as we talk. There has been zero, zero hangover. There's always a hangover in Las Vegas, Sean. No hangover in Las Vegas right now for the Vegas Golden Knights. And this is so rare. Like, you're like, oh, they're four and oh. I, I think there's been two other Stanley Cup champions that have opened a season four and oh. The last one to do it was the Red Wings in 97 98. They opened yeah. up four and oh. What'd they do that year? They went on and won it again. Yeah. So, uh, but a, a complete rarity to even get this far without losing. And, and there's a chance when they get to that game on the 24th, they could still be unbeaten. And they've gotten it from everybody. Like Jack Eichel already has four points. Chandler Stevenson, our good friend, who's, who's, gone from a little used player in Washington to maybe one of the most valuable players on the Vegas roster leads the team with five goals. I mean, five points, their defense, even without Petrangelo for a couple of games and without white cloud has been solid. Like they just literally have not missed a beat. Yeah, no, they, they look good. That So th their schedule, you're right. I mean, they could do it. They get Thursday tonight as we're talking, they play the Winnipeg jets in Winnipeg Saturday. They do the Bedard home opener. They're Connor Bedard's first home game at United Center with the Chicago Blackhawks. That's Saturday. Vegas is there. And then they play on the 24th against Philadelphia. Absolutely. They could be 6-0 and by the time they play that game. But anyway, we did. I've, I've talked about it. Brian Slagle, our good friend, had a great conversation with Jack Eichel about music. Here is that conversation that Brian had with Jack Eichel. First of all, as a Golden Knights season ticket holder from day one, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the support. So we got to talk music. Uh, in my research, you have, in my personal opinion, impeccable music taste. Oh, thank you. So we'll get into a lot of it. But what are you listening to now? What am I listening to now? Uh, I went to a Morgan Wallen concert this summer, and I'm, I wouldn't say I'm the biggest country guy, but um, you know, he's played a lot in the locker room, so I, I've turned a, a liking to him. Uh, Zach Bryan just came out with a new album. I've liked that a lot as well. Um, other than that, a lot of the same for me. Uh, I'm a big Tame Impala fan. Um, I like my morning jacket. Um, you know, if I'm in the gym, I might listen to a little bit of rap. Um, I mean, uh, my genres are pretty, it's pretty widespread. So it's kind of all depends on the crowd and what I'm feeling. Where did you see Morgan Wallen? Uh, Fenway Park. Ah, oh, nice, nice. Yeah. I, so I have a weird connection with Morgan Wallen. Um, not a country guy at all. I'm rock metal, obviously. But my girlfriend, who's also not into that 
found this Morgan Wallen guy before a lot of people knew who he was. She got into it. So I was doing the research, like, who is this guy? It turns out that his entire band are all huge heavy metal fans. All they right. actually have a heavy metal side project band. So we went to go see him in Shreveport, Louisiana, before he completely blew up. Hung out with the band, the nicest guys, his crew, they're all, like, amazing people. And they're all big metalheads. So, really? so that's why it might, might, might be why you like Morgan Wallen, because they're a little of that rock metal background. Yeah, there. maybe. Yeah, he's got, a good, uh, he's got a good sound to him. I think, he, I think he does a lot of different, like, I don't think it's just traditional country. No. Um, so it's got a good, it's got a good uh, feel to it, so I like it. And it's a big show, too. It is, yeah. The show was great. He did three straight nights at Fenway. Um, I ended up going to the last one, but... He played, uh, he played for two, two and a half hours, and it was a great show. So a few years ago, you did like this whole music bracket, yep. which looked super cool. Who won your bracket? Well, I ended up shutting it down. It was mid-COVID, and I was kind of getting sick of social media and everything <laughs> people were putting on it. So I ended up finishing it social media-wise. Who won mine? Uh, the Rolling Stones. All right. I was going to ask you because I know you're a Beatles uh, and Stones guy. I actually, you know what, going back... I don't know, maybe the Beatles. I know the final was the Beatles and the Stones, which they were one seeds in the bracket. Um, but I can't remember who won, whether it was the Stones or the Beatles. I tried to take a lot of different things into account. You know, number of hits, uh, tours, um, you know, how long they've been doing it, like what, when ranking them, uh, popularity, um, you know, different, uh, different decades of people that have become fans. So, I, I mean, it's tough. It's tough to think of 64 bands that, that you can, uh, you know, rank basically one to 64 almost. Um, That's really hard. You have a lot of time on your hands during COVID. People aren't really doing much. <laughs> At your core, because that's always the question for a lot of rock and rollers, be- Stones or Beatles? Like, that's everybody has have yeah. one answer. Uh, I'd probably say I'm a little more of a Stones guy. I lean, I lean that way, too. There's no wrong answer no, there, No, I don't too, think obviously. there is. Uh, my dad's more of a Beatles guy, uh, but he loves the Stones, you know. Um, I love the Beatles. I like the Stones. Um, there's a lot. Fleetwood Mac. Uh, there's a lot of good... There's a lot of good classic rock. So I, I was oh, a big I Jim know. Morrison guy for years. Uh, still am. I was a big fan of The Doors, so... Uh, I had a poster hidden in my kitchen and T-shirts, and so I like the Doors a lot. Um, trying to think, I actually you know what I've been on a big Doobie Brothers kick. Really, the Doobie Brothers are one of my favorites. See, so you're it's interesting because you're pretty young, so obviously a lot of these bands. You know, I I grew up in the '70s, so I got to see all yeah. these bands live. But you're a younger guy. Like, how did you get into all this stuff? Uh, through my parents. My dad was a big music guy growing up. I wouldn't say my mom was, but she. She kind of adopted it through him. Um, my sister's big into music. Um, I wish I could tell you that I play some instrument really well, uh, but I don't. Um, I've messed around on the piano, messed around with the guitar, but never really took it up enough to, uh, you know, be good at it. But yeah, I just I like. Uh, I feel like I'm always listening to music. You know, when you get in the car or if you're at home and you know you're not watching TV. So uh, it was constantly on at our house growing up, and um, so that's sort of where I got the. The taste for it. I know you're a bit of a Metallica guy too. Of course, they started yep. out with us. I've known Lars since before there was a Metallica. So I guess the story was that going to games when you were a kid, your dad would play Metallica a lot. Yeah. So it was. Uh, we had a couple CDs. We had uh, we had the Stone Temple Pilots Thank You album, um, and that was a big one for a while. And you know, we'd listen to that on the way to the rink basically every day. Uh, so that. That was where, you know, Stone Temple Pilots were one of my favorite bands. Um, that's where my love for them came, and that, that CD started skipping. <laughs> so when that started skipping, we, we had a Metallica album. I think there were some Pearl Jam ones in there. So um, those are probably the three that I listened to the most when I was, you know, going to the, going to the rink uh, as a kid. Did you get to, S- did you get to see STP at all? With- no, unfortunately, uh, yeah, I mean... You know, with Scott Whelan passing, um, I would still love to see them. Uh, I just feel like the the show wouldn't be the same without him. No, it's I mean, without him, it's not the show. Sure. So does that mean you were a Velvet Revolver guy as well? I liked Velvet Revolver, yeah. I mean, he was he had, a, he had an incredible voice. And, um, you know, so selfishly, I wish uh, I wish he was, you know, obviously still 
you know, with or still alive, but I wish he had, you know, Stone Temple Pilots was still something that you could go see. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of artists that, you know, unfortunately they're not, uh, they're not giving us the opportunity to go see them. And, you know, some, some artists have, you know, passed away and, you know, not with us anymore. Some, some bands have split up, but, um, yeah. yeah, and he was a sweetheart of a guy, too. I met him on, never at STP, but at Velvet Revolver, because I'm buddies with Slash, so I used to go see them. And what a nice guy, and an unbelievably talented singer, too. It, sure it really was, is yeah. a shame. So, favorite concerts? Favorite shows? Um, 2019, I saw Pearl Jam at Fenway. Nice, wow. It was very good. Um, I saw the Foo Fighters that same summer, and that was phenomenal. Um... I saw the Stones at Gillette Stadium um, a few summers ago as well, and, and that was a great show. Um, Have you seen Metallica yet? I haven't seen Metallica. No, you got to go. I haven't seen Metallica, no. My first concert ever was the Dropkick Murphys. Yes! I love them. My buddy is their sound guy. They're all amazing. The Dropkick Murphys and the Mighty Mighty Boss Stones. I've seen yeah. the Dropkicks a few times. The Bostons are dear, dear friends of mine. They're some of the best people on, the, on earth. That's a, yeah. that's a great first concert. It was a good first show, yeah. Well, that's a that's an awesome one. Wow, that's amazing. Yes, yeah, unfortunately for you, again, you know, being into all this stuff, like some of these bands just don't exist anymore. Right. So, uh, if you could go back in time to see one or two concerts, wh who would they be? That's a pretty good question. Um, the one I always go to is, if I could see one, I would go see Marvin Gaye. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. He's incredible, by yeah, the way. Incredible. Um, he'd probably be first on my list. Just probably for my love of STP, I'd probably say I'd, I'd go see them um, if Scott Whelan was still here. Um, they're probably one of my favorites. Uh, probably know some of you know, their music the most, so probably them. Yeah, that makes sense. So I think, I think I saw that you're reading some of the rock biographies. I think you're doing Chili Peppers. And I a did couple that others. one, yeah. Scar Tissue. The Fleetwood Mac fan, right? I am. You, you have to read Mick Fleetwood's book. It's right. so great. There's a lot of books on Fleetwood Mac, but his yeah. book is really good and really kind of gets to the dirt of a lot of the stuff that they're going through. It's very honest. It's a really highly recommended right. read. I'll have, to, I'll have to get on that. I'm looking for some new reading material. Yeah, get, there's a lot of great... I read tons of rock biography books, but they're what really good. What else you got? I don't think you're a super heavy fan, so you know, Black Sabbath at all? No, but I know him. If I were to go heavy, I don't know. I like Five Finger Death Punch, a few of those bands. You know Chris, Kale? I don't know him personally, just so, fan. Real quick, Chris Kale is one of my favorite hockey stories of all time. Very first night's game, came here, he went to a preseason game, and I ran into him, I said, oh, hey, you're in we were talking. He's like, I've never seen a live hockey game before. Three weeks later, he's completely obsessed. He's like on the road in his hotel room, turning the night's games on, and he's become a massive hockey well, fan. hopefully he hears that. this. Yeah, I'll make sure, I'll make sure he hears it. He, he's a good dude. With Sabbath, uh, Geezer Butler's book, I just read his book recently. He's actually a, a new Henderson resident as well. Oh, all right. But it's, it's a really good book. Even just, not a, if you're not a Black Sabbath fan, it's just a really interesting story about the music business, yeah. especially in the 70s. There's a lot going on there. I would read that for sure. You just had the compi, hockey camp, and I, nonetheless, even before I even knew I was going to talk to you, probably 10 people were raving about how amazing this camp was. What, what made it so special? Um, I think the people involved, probably. Um, you know, we had so many great, so many great kids that came to the camp, and you know, it's not possible without them uh, being here. Um, you know, hockey's obviously grown at a rapid pace here in Las Vegas, and I think people are people are crazy about it. <laughs> um, you know, it's middle of July, it's 115 degrees out, and they want to be in the rink. So, oh, well, it's probably the coolest place to be, actually. So. Uh, but no, I mean the kids were the kids were incredible. We did four different groups, um, two hours each on the ice a day for four days. So uh, the parents were awesome. Uh, you know, all the people that helped the camp run smoothly. You know, the coaches, some of the staff in the arena, some of the people that were you know behind the scenes doing work. Um, you know, it, it it takes a lot of it takes a lot of helping hands to put a camp together. And you know, we had over two hundred kids that came through that week and. Everything ran pretty smoothly, so uh, you know, obviously, credit to the to the Knights organization and the Knights Youth Hockey programs, and um, you know, all all the people in Vegas who came. And you know what? Honestly, there were some kids that traveled in here from outside of Vegas, and 
I uh, just had heard about the camp, and uh, so it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. I mean, that was uh, that was one of the highlights of my summer. That's awesome. Well, thanks for doing that. That's yeah. pretty amazing. So you like living out in Vegas? Yeah, I love it. It's incredible. Favorite restaurants? Favorite restaurants. Um, Other Mama Sushi. You know yep. What? Yeah. Other Mama Sushi is probably one of my favorites. That's, that's like a weekly one for me. Um, I like Harlow right here. I like Harlow a lot. Uh, Milo's is good at the Venetian uh, if you want some fish. Um, Spago. Uh, Al Salido, Posto. Uh, there's a lot. I mean, there's Vegas, many. Yep. Yeah, Vegas has so many great restaurants. I'm probably missing a few of my favorites that I go to a lot, but those are probably the top ones. Well, good. You know your food and your music. I, yeah. I like that. Really appreciate you doing this, yeah, too. Thank you anytime. so much. Great stuff there from Brian Slagle, our good friend. Uh, again, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Metal Blade Records, talking music with Jack Eichel. Jack knows his music, as I said. That was a Fun conversation to listen in on as it was happening, and I hope you enjoyed it as well, listening to it now. Uh, Eichel was a number two pick in the 2015 NHL draft, and and it's funny that the draft has come into the news this week as we wrap up here with a couple of news and notes issues, Sean. The, the draft is in the news because there's talk in league circles now of what they're calling a, a decentralized draft, and basically kind of how the NFL does it, right? So you have a rep from each team at the draft and the players would be at the draft, but the team would have sort of a war room in its headquarters and you'd go to the war room to see, you know, the video and all that. And the draft would become the way I kind of see it as less of a working environment and more of a party. It's already a party, but it's less of a working environment for the executives at the draft and, and, and everybody there and more of just a party for, you know, personnel and, and the players who are being drafted and whatnot. And I, I get it. And I'm kind of torn, though, because I, I love the way our draft is done because everybody's in the same place. The only time of the year where everybody's in the same place who's involved in the NHL in any capacity. And I love being there because that's where the news happens. You know, you're, you're watching news happen live. I love that part of our draft, but I can also understand it. You know, from the from the executive's perspective of it's a lot easier to get work done when you're in your home environment and you're not being, you know, you're not in the midst of a crowd, if you will. Our draft is what makes us unique, right? We're the only ones left that do a centralized, quote unquote, centralized draft. I'm going to double down. I'm not only going to say that they should keep it that way, but they should do the awards in the same place like they do now. And then they should make everybody stay for the first day of free agency. That would be fantastic and never happened. It will never happen. You got to think outside the box, Dan. Listen, that's, where I'm, that's where I'm going. Turn it into a convention, even more so than it is now. You start with the party, with the with the awards. Then you go down to the business of team building with the draft. That's kind of half and half. And then you get down to the free agent frenzy. Can you imagine the TV ratings, especially in Canada, if you had all 32 GMs in one place to react to everything that happens? instead of the piecemeal way it's done now. And the GMs would be there, you know, talking trades, talking whatever. It would be a week-long celebration of hockey, and there would be so much business done face-to-face, which I think is more important even today with texting and cell phones and Zooms. Face-to-face is where the best business gets done. Well, I think of the baseball winter meetings. Like, that's kind of the way I it would envision that almost a little bit different because now you know you're signing guys it's not all about trades and whatnot that would be that would be fantastic to be front and center for all of that I think it would be great television great drama and that's really what this is this is entertainment it's supposed it's business but it's business entertainment and that's kind of that's that would be entertaining hockey fans no games going on but where's your GM going who's he talking to Right. What table is he going to? Oh, if you're going to do it in that sense. So I, I think that would be great. I, I remember, I mean, we covered it a little bit before they changed it. The GM meetings that you would happen before the trade deadline. Right. Because that was theater to be there and to be chronicling it live to see. Oh, wait, Ken Holland. He's huddled with David Poyle. What are they talking about? And two hours later, a trade's made. Well, we saw the makings of it happening right then and there. That's entertainment. That's drama. I am 100 percent. Sean on board with that. I just don't think it, 
I don't think it would happen, but I, I'm 100% on board on that. I shouldn't say I don't think it would happen because you know what? With Steve Mayer running it, nothing's off the table. You got to go big, Dan. That's what I'm doing, going big. Yeah, definitely. Well, listen, hey, a lot of stuff going on around the National Hockey League right now. We had Ryan Huska, Jack Eichel this week. Uh, season's gearing up. Season's season's going in full bore right now. And uh, maybe, maybe, Sean, by the time we talk next week, the Vegas Golden Knights will have a loss. Maybe. I don't know if they will, though. But the Chicago Blackhawks will finally play at home and yeah. will have seen Bedard mania reach its crescendo. Because it's hard to believe we're this deep into the season and the Blackhawk fans who are driving all this excitement about Connor Bedard have yet to see him play in a regular season game. And he's been fantastic so far. So Saturday, it's going to be the Madhouse at Madison as they welcome home their, their newest savior. Yep, that'll be fun. Connor Bedard's first home game. We'll talk about it a little bit next week. Until then, enjoy the hockey.